Good morning, welcome to Boys Town. Today it's a little cloudy here in the village of Boys Town, but it's a perfect day to continue on our history at Boys Town week. And today we're going to learn about a medical history at Boys Town. Medical history has been part of Boys Town since 1917 when Father Planning created Boys Town. Now I'm here with Ryan, and Ryan's going to give us a little history of, the, of medical history at Boys Town. Hi, thanks, Tom. So my name is Ryan McCreary. I'm the vice president of research here at Boys Town, and uh, I'm really excited to talk about the history of both medicine and research at Boys Town. So most people know that Father Flanagan came and founded Boys Town over 100 years ago, but what a lot of people don't realize is that he had a very scientific mind, and he often described the village of Boys Town as an experimental station to help kids. And we've really taken that mission uh, to its T over the last 40 years with the establishment of Boys Town National Research Hospital, because as you can imagine, with the kids that Father Flanagan uh, brought to the campus and have been cared for ever since, they have medical needs, and uh, many of them need support, and so we have great healthcare services here on campus that not only serve the kids that we serve in our mission, but also the community. And so many of you who are watching this may have uh, a Boys Town pediatrician for your children, or see a Boys Town ear, nose, and throat doctor um, for uh, ear, nose, and throat issues. So we have great medical services here, um, and one thing that's really unique about that is that along with those medical services, we have research programs that complement those things. So when people think about research, sometimes they think about, oh, some scientists in a lab somewhere doing something that may not help people for 10 or 20 years. But here at Boys Town, our research is different in that it's poised to help our patients and families that we serve. And so every research program that we have must have a clinical program that goes along with it. And what that allows us to do is it allows our scientists to understand what the real problems are that our children and families are facing, and also allows the children and families that we serve to help further science and participate in research. And we're here today in the Center for Human Performance Optimization on the Boys Town campus to talk with Dr. Brad Poor about a research program and a clinical program that live together and really fulfill that mission that Father Flanagan, I think, would appreciate. Well, hi everybody, thanks for having us. And yeah, I'm Brent Corr, I'm the Associate Director of Physical Rehabilitation here at the Center for Human Performance Optimization. And we are Boys Town Physical Therapy here at CHPO. So we created a space that is less medical and hopefully very community friendly for individuals um, to come in and engage in physical activity and explore movement in a new way. So we serve a broad population uh, in combination with the neuroscience research across the street that Dr. McCreary mentioned, uh, as well as Boys Town Pediatrics here um, on campus. So BTNRH and referrals come to us, as well as clinical research here in real time. And I like to tell everybody that when you walk through the doors here, you might not be able to tell who's receiving research intervention and who's receiving just our standard clinical care. And we try to bring that to our patients because we believe that if it's, if it's worth investigating, if it's, if it's cutting edge, we should bring it to them in real time as much as possible. So we created this space to do that. We have a lot of fun equipment to try to afford people the opportunities to move in new and exciting ways. And so we can walk through the space and talk a little bit about what the equipment is. Uh, this first one here uh, that's hung from the ceiling is called the Enlighten System. It's, an, it's a body weight support system, which means that it allows you to move without falling. So, you uh, strap into a harness here, and the harness will hold you up based on how tight we make the straps. But what's unique about this system is you can move 360 degrees within this 200 square foot space. So you can walk in any direction and maintain that body weight support. And we built this system in here in part to use it for therapy, but also to showcase the families that this is a system that can actually be feasibly built in your home. So. Uh, durable medical equipment and mobility equipment is expensive, um, and it often occupies people's hands. So if you have a balance disturbance or you frequently fall, or maybe you're not able to hold yourself up under your own uh, with your legs, but you would like to be able to be mobile in your home, this is a system that you could have in, and you could work in your kitchen and do meal preparation and be strapped in so that you don't have to be fear fearful of falling. Um, so we wanted families to have kind of access to it, to touch it, to feel it, to experience it to know that if it was something that they could have in their own hands. One sort of, I don't know if I'd call it a limitation, but some, one sort of limitation of this style of body weight support system, you can see is that if you walked up to a surface and you needed to go up, so if you needed to step up, 
you no longer have that support of that system then. And so to complement this style of system, we also have this dynamic body weight support track called the zero G. And so that system is a robotic system that runs off the computer. And there we can dial in how much percent of your body weight we want to support you. So anything from 10% to even as much as 90% of your body weight, and that robot will hold you up. And what's unique about it though, is that you can travel linearly along that track up to five miles an hour. So you can walk pretty quickly and it'll keep up with you. Um, but you can also travel vertically. So we have a set of stairs, we can pull the stairs out. You can practice stairs, climbing the stairs and coming back down if that's part of it. Um, but one big feature that we like to use is some of the fall prevention or fall protection strategies with it. So we know that there's a cycle when you fall that if you've experienced a fall or if you're fearful, fearful of falling, you tend to change the way you move. And actually that changing of the way you move puts you at an increased risk for falling because now you're probably over concentrating on your movement or overly hesitant with some of that movement. And so that's a vicious cycle then because now you're at higher risk for falling and you fall and then you're more nervous about falling. So with this system, we can actually allow you to experience the fall but do it safely. So it slowly lowers you to the ground if you've taken that misstep. And then what we do here is motor problem solving. So we talk through what do you think happened? How do you, what do you think contributed to that fall? How do we correct it in the next time? As well as working on that transfer up from the ground. So there's a huge embarrassment factor with falling or being fearful of not being able to get back up again. And now we can practice those transfers back up on the floor, hopefully breaking that cycle, building that confidence. And it's more than just a, a bigger, faster, stronger individual, right? It's this sort of this psyche or this mental change of like, now I have the confidence, now I have the motor competence to go out and tackle things in the world because I've experienced it here in this system. There's also games and things built into it that are really engaging for some of the younger kids. You can play Tetris for those of us who are a little older. Remember Tetris, it's kind of in a mobile revival out here. So uh, some, some kids like to play games like that and then there's target matching where you have to move your body and it will track with you. So super fun system in that way. As Dr. McCreary mentioned with the clinical uh, research integration, we also do clinical outcome data or research outcome data here in this clinic. So anything that is a clinical outcome. So Dr. McCreary talked about kind of the bench top science where you're making these discoveries on what is happening with the body and it's specifically for us it's what's happening with the brain and neuroscience. But we want to always have a, a complementary clinical measure that, that relates to that. So those clinical outcomes come here. So uh, Katie Bemis, the other physical therapist, and I uh, conduct those clinical outcomes. And those are things that then help translate to the clinician practicing in the field who may not have access to all the scientific stuff, but understand how does that then impact me or how do I know if I'm doing the thing that they're talking about because now we have a clinical measure that helps us gauge that. So everything from what we call a spatial temporal gauge, so you can walk across this map here and it captures all kinds of dynamics about the way that you walk. Uh, in the computer, and so that's a nice measure and available in many clinics, uh, but more than anything, it's a, it's a translatable language to the clinicians in the clinic, um, as well as just kind of some functional movement things that we do with the open space here. Uh, we have a couple of other interesting treadmills here. Um, this is actually a manual treadmill. Tom, dare you? Would you like to try Sure, it? I'll try okay. it, yes. So this treadmill does not have a motor in it that drives it. Tom drives the treadmill. So yeah, hold on. Yeah, there you go. And as you, uh, as you walk, so you actually drive the bell. And this is a different form of walking. And I think we do a lot of what we call gauge training, or teaching people about walking and how they walk. Um, and I think what gets missed on a standard treadmill is that that treadmill is driving. The treadmill is creating the power that moves you. And all you're doing is kind of stepping in reaction, which is a key part of walking. But 80% of the power production, 80% of what moves you forward comes from your ankle and that, that uh, power that you have to put in to move yourself forward. And you don't really get that on the treadmill because the motor's doing the work. Sure. And you can probably feel, especially in the suit and everything yeah. else, within a few seconds, you, this is different than a different experience. So I'm really different. impressed with the amount of power that Tom is creating. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we can, yeah, we can see it around. Real time, and that's a, that's another really good thing that Dr. McCreary brings up is that we try to provide multimodal feedback to all of our participants, so uh, and patients, so that they can see, am I actually doing what you're asking me to do in real time more than just my feedback? But they get something tangible. You can 
stop whenever you like. It will be done. But thanks for demonstrating that. But again, this is another kind of key component uh, to a lot of our therapies. And it provides access uh, to youth and um, for us and our research individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities to really state-of-the-art equipment that they may not otherwise have access to. So this is a common treadmill seen in fitness facilities, but it's also a treadmill that uh, high-level athletes use to train for speed. And so just that sort of cool factor and engagement in therapy um, increases when somebody knows that they're getting access to something that is cutting edge and new and they, they're getting to try and train on the best of the best, right? So you, the expectations that you have of yourself change when you get to train in that way. So we, lo we love to use that a lot. We also have a kind of a different version of a treadmill called, this is called a split belt treadmill. And it actually has two belts on it. So this means that as you stand on it, you can actually drive the, uh, drive the uh, treadmill with the computer. And then we can have the legs do different things at different speeds. So uh, it was originally designed for individuals who have suffered a stroke. And if you can picture an individual who has a stroke, then maybe you have one side of their body that is kind of weak. And that treadmill was used to sort of drive that weak side to do what they wanted to do. And in part because we don't strive for sort of a normalization of individuals, but also because we're a motor problem solving clinic, um, we use it less to sort of drive to a target and more to try to, uh, I don't know if gamify is the right thing, but again, increase engagement and sort of play with different obstacles and strategies. So we'll have you walking along and at a certain speed, and maybe we'll slow a belt down or speed a belt up, speed a belt up, and see if you can feel what's happening. Uh, that, that again is another translation from something that we've learned from the neuroscience work across the street, that that sort of sensory information or feeling what your limbs are doing is actually a key component to how we learn how to move them. If you have ever woken up with your arm asleep and you try to move it, it's very awkward and cumbersome, right? Because you don't have that sensory information. You have full motor control, but you don't have that sensory information to know where your arm is at in space, which makes it really hard to move. So lots of our individuals who have either developed with a uh, motor disability or maybe have had an injury, uh, maybe their sensory system has been received an insult that they don't get that sensory information. So we try to highlight it with tasks like this so that we can hopefully up their um, results on the, on the back side of it. Um, we have the blaze pods over here and the reaction wall that maybe some of you online uh, got to see because we were so grateful that this got featured on ESPN even. Um, so it is a reaction time wall where the lights will light up and you're trying to hit the lights um, and get as many as you can. We took it down to the College World Series and had numerous uh, users and like I said, ESPN kind of picked it up, thought it was a cool thing, so we were grateful for that. Um, but again, it's another, this is, these are technologies and things that are used for high level athletes and we're making sure that they're, we're bringing them uh, as an accessible thing to sort of all youth and individuals with a variety of abilities to train and be more motor confident with their skill. We have uh, sort of just general fitness, and sort of your run-of-the-mill PT clinic. Uh, one of the things that is really important to me as uh, a collaborator in research and clinical practice is that we want a foot in the research world to know what is cutting edge and what is happening and challenging us in our practice regularly. But we also have to keep a foot grounded in the clinic because otherwise if you create this kind of petri dish uh, research isolated from what the clinical translation is, you can create a lot of really great things that can't ever mean anything to the therapist or to the patient because there are too many barriers to get there. So we see patients uh, medically, uh, as I said earlier, so just general referrals as a regular pediatric clinic in part because it's good for us as uh, clinical researchers to remember what it's like to have to do the documentation, have to get the insurance authorization, have to know what are the barriers to these programs we're developing and trying to implement and can we get insurance companies to reimburse us for them. So battling through all those problems in addition to the research is really important. So we want to keep some equipment in the space also that is used in kind of every uh, PT clinic out there. So a new step machine, but we have it fully equipped for with rehab accessories so that those who maybe can't move things fully under their own power or maybe can't create the postures necessary to do it safely we have some support systems in place there that allow them to 
get on and off and make sure that they're safe while they're doing it. Um, we have this total gym, which again is kind of standard PT uh, equipment. And this is really a, a squat machine. So I used to, I'll just show you. If you've uh, seen any Chuck Norris or Christy Brinkley video, it's very much the same thing. It's just a sort of a rehab version of it. But you can do squats, we can do all kinds of things on it. But the squats and being able to perform that task is what really what this machine is designed for. We like it here a lot for our population um, because it allows an accessible means to try to practice something like a squat or like when you get up from a chair, uh, but with the postural stability of the sled. So this is something that we use for individuals with a variety of abilities. Uh, kind of one of my favorite stories that I like to tell is that we have done some power training here in clinic um, and as part of our research, we currently have a grant from the Foundation for Physical Therapy Research um, that is looking at uh, power training for individuals with cerebral palsy. And that power training is different maybe than when you think about power lifting of lifting as heavy as you can, but this is lifting for speed, lifting for velocity. And the thought behind it is that when you go out and move in the, in the world, you don't often have to use your maximum strength, but you do often have to react quickly to be able to move quickly if you stumble or something like that to prevent a fall. Um, and generally, movement is easier when it's a little more explosive. So if you stood up from a chair really slowly, that's a lot more work than if you stand up explosively. Uh, same with stairs and things like that. So um, my story is that uh, there was an individual who came in in a power wheelchair and he had enrolled in the power training study. And I said, okay, so we're gonna get on this sled and we're gonna see how much you can squat on this sled. Then he kind of looks at me and he says, well, you know my legs don't work. I said, well, I understand what you're, what you're telling me, but let's just try, okay? So let's just try. So we get into the sled and we do a few of the squats with the sled. Well, that, okay, I can actually lift this. I can make this thing work. Well, let's put some weight on here, right? So we put some weight up on the, on the bar and we start to lift and we do the lifting thing. Long story short, by the end of the study, uh, this person was you know, lifting maybe upwards of close to 400 pounds. And so, again, for me, um, and in the context of how we uh, do things, and I think along with this boys town model of changing the, the perspective of the child, changing the perspective of what they know of themselves or believe of themselves, this individual was stronger, yes, and more powerful, uh, but bigger than that, came in saying, my legs don't work left squatting 400 pounds and had a, just a different perspective of what they were capable of, what they could try. Um, what was also cool is now you have this social network because this person was in, in high school and so going to school and seeing power lifters at school and having a conversation with peers of, oh yeah, I, I do some power lifting, this is what it looks like for me. And uh, So now you have peer groups and, and social outlets that you maybe wouldn't have had before. Uh, so it's bigger than just the bigger, faster, stronger. It's, it's really in changing perspectives and, and, um, and really expectations for individuals when they come in here and try this. This is uh, also kind of a fun uh, clinical research translation and that when we first started the power training study, the intent of moving faster and what that looked like was a difficult concept. And so how do you know if you're lifting fast enough? Um, and kind of the initial uh, thought process was you just tell somebody to push harder and the typical uh, way it was performed in the clinic was really just a therapist kind of barking in your face going come on push 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 and that's not really my style for therapy uh, and it's exhausting for both of us and not everybody appreciates that kind of feedback right uh, so with in collaboration with Dr. Kurz across the street we developed a system where we could actually instrument the total gym and give real-time feedback on this computer as to how fast you are lifting. And so now I know as a therapist how fast you're lifting, you know how fast you're lifting, I can set a target for how fast we want to lift. And now we have some actual feedback and some measurement of how we're progressing with things. And we found that that made a tremendous difference for individuals who were participating in the study. Those who got feedback did remarkably better with their power production than those who were not getting feedback. So it told us a couple things. It told us people can learn, even individuals who maybe uh, may have not believed to be able to learn and move in a new way, they can. And two, uh, different types of feedback matters and people learn in different ways. And so giving them every opportunity and real, actually some technical things might actually be helpful uh, to actually learn how to do it differently. So that was kind of fun because that was 
100% organically grown out of that clinical translation research. If I was just a clinician in the clinic and not, did not have access to that research and the technology across the street, we wouldn't have been able to develop that device. And likewise, the device just built by itself wouldn't have had that full translation or known impact uh, with the individual who wouldn't have got to try it in real time with those people. So really proud of that and, and what the, what's the come from that. So the rest of the clinic is really just as it is. We have turf here down here, again, just as kind of an unstable or a different type of surface to allow people to move across. So you have carpet, a solid floor, and grass to kind of move in, and you can feel that it's a little bit different. We have a standard exam room uh, just to do the things. Again, we do our clinical outcome measures in, in, in there. Um, one thing I'm really proud of is kind of the artwork and some of the feature. We took kind of a Hall of History theme when we brought it in here uh, to just to kind of keep it bright and keep it cheery. But again, I think it speaks to what our talk here is about, of this full spectrum. You can see the history on the walls here. You can see the today on the walls. And you should know in this space that this is the healthcare impact of what's, what's happening here on this campus. Definitely. I want to thank yeah. you for allowing us to come visit with you today. And thank you for joining us today yeah. also. This is just an example how the Boys Town history keeps evolving and changing. Father Flanagan said continue to help children move forward, and that's what we do today in the village of Boys Town. Thank you for joining us today, and we'll see you tomorrow for another history event here. Thank you very much.